Good to have you, Mark. Thanks for doing this. My, uh, my pleasure, Tom. I, I actually, that's quite fun. So look forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, we're live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this installment of Thunderbird Global Dialogue brought to you by Thunderbirds Executive Education. I'm Tom Hunsaker, Associate Dean of Innovation at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. We're really pleased that you could join us and, and really happy to have uh, an esteemed colleague with us, Dr. Mark Esposito, renowned expert in global shifts and the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, with a particular expertise in uh, artificial intelligence. And really excited, uh, Mark and I have, have gone back and forth on a number of these topics and, and really thrilled that he can share with you a couple of, of real strong keys in terms of understanding, appreciating, and, and even thriving in the new normal and how companies can take advantage of it through innovation. You know, we, we all know that we're living in unprecedented, I know we're probably a little bit tired of the word unprecedented times. Um, but even beyond COVID, these new technologies such as AI and genetic engineering are fusing the physical, biological, and digital worlds and fundamentally changing the way we live and work and relate with each other. We, we all know this, we feel this, we're experiencing this. I also want you to know that Thunderbird is absolutely committed to providing leading edge thought leadership and development to help the range of enterprises and disciplines to thrive now and, and certainly in these very trying times, but also well into the future. So we're absolutely thrilled to have Mark's expertise in, in helping in this effort. Now, a couple of words about process. Um, we want this to be interactive. We're, we're certainly going to give the floor to Mark for the first 30 to, to 40 minutes. But then beyond that, we welcome your questions and comments throughout the session. In order to do so, let's, let's be as organized as we can. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and type in your questions and comments. We'll have time at the end of the session to address them, and we're going to do our absolute best to respond to as many of them as we can. Uh, also, please stay tuned at the very end of the session. Uh, we'd love to give you a bit of a preview of some of the digital offerings through Thunderbird Executive Education and also some future installments of, of these global dialogues. So with that, I would love to turn the time over to my esteemed friend and, and faculty colleague, Dr. Mark Esposito. Over to you, Mark. Thanks so much, Tom. And I think by now you can also see me. Um, I am, like many of us in this period of time, uh, connecting from uh, a lockdown location, but that's, um, that's a detail that one day we'll be happy to share as a memory. Um, so thank you for joining today, this important conversation we're having about the uncertain times as, uh, as Tom has already anticipated, I think we had a bit of overdrive in hearing this conversation over and over again, especially in this particular weeks. Uh, but this conversation doesn't start now with uh, the current um, crisis we're currently experiencing, it's a conversation that we had already for quite some time. Um, I myself have been researching volatility for uh, a number of years now. And in fact, when I'm going to uh, uh, start sharing my contest or research and why I would like to share some ideas with you today, um, I really do it from where this all started on a more personal level. And from there, we'll uh, try to use the Q&A as a way to engage and to have a conversation about uh, where this uh, uncertain time are gonna lead us and whether as Tom was uh, already um, anticipating this new normal uh, will be a normal that will uh, uh, eventually maximize our well-being and the opportunity that we have around us. But let's start. Um, 
So where did it start for me? Uh, this is my 2017 book together with Terence C, who is a, a friend, as a colleague, a co-author. Uh, and Terence and I, we started this journey in trying to really understand how the future unfolds. We started in 2015 when uh, we were uh, doing corporate training and we started to feel and sense a lot of anxiety and angst in our, in our uh, executive audiences. And we started to maybe ask the question, what is really so worrisome? And the answer was coming with some form of recurrence around the same areas. So we decided to uh, start uh, a journey that led to the book. And the book was then encapsulated into a framework called Drive. The reason why we decided to have a framework is that as we are both business school professors, framework, they lend themselves very well in the classroom environment for exercising and cases. But we're also very aware the frameworks are limited in their application. So it's just the ability to understand the context that creates the highest uh, strategic value. But nonetheless, we decided to go in that direction. So from this conversation with about 80 CEOs around the world, the book came and the framework drive was somehow uh, originated. Now, what DRY stands for is five specific trajectories uh, that I will share with you now. This trajectory are in demographics and social changes, so really looking at in which way we are profoundly changing our, our social fabric. Resource scarcity, so it's the whole conversation about resources, the climate, the fact that we're living um, with a major change in the narrative about the natural resources than the one that we have inherited from the 20th centuries. 20th century. Inequalities because the financial um, condition have been shaken by the 2008 crisis and to some extent the gap between those who have those who don't really have has been widening at a pace we've never seen before in modern history. Volatility, scale and complexity which is uh, intentionally in my, um, in my highlights because of what we're going to talk about today and we're, we're going to spend more time about it. And enterprise and dynamics was more about looking at the innovation coming from country that were not historically renowned for innovation. Now, why volatility, scale, and complexity is still um, somehow a topic of reference today? First of all, because we started to really see a transformation of our world as we have entered into a globalized society with globalized uh, mobility and with global supply chains. We have seen the world becoming multilateral and, and also geographically distributed across multiple uh, hubs, no longer the centrality of the West, but the emerging economies, the drop, of course, of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the rise of country like China and India, change for good the nature of our society. Now, when I say change for good, it means that if we were coming from a period of normative growth, a period in which we could use some form of linear model to determine which type of growth uh, uh, prospect we will have in the future, Suddenly, as we were expanding the number of variables that we have in the system, we equally expanded our, uh, we expanded our opportunity, but also decreased our ability to predict business as usual. So more and more companies have been facing volatile cycle in which performance peaks could be very high and very low with a relatively short period of time. The scale of our, uh, of our operation might have changed by becoming global entities, global in the meaning that we really were reaching across the globe, uh, customers and population we have never reached before. And all of this didn't come without a cost. The cost is that suddenly the system became more complex because we had transformed systems from actually from structured that used to be designed around industrial silos to mainly networks. And networks by their own design, they tend to be more complex because of the increasing ability um, to uh, evolve and transform. Now, volatility, scale, and complexity was really the V of the dry framework, and we decided to go deeper into that. We could have really feel that uncertainty was in the air. There is a very famous acronym that is being coined around a period of time where we were researching. You might have heard it before. It's called VUCA, V-U-C-A. It stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So our, our work on volatility was kind of going in the direction of the VUCA world. And really trying to make sense of everything that was happening. Now, as a disclaimer, both Terence and I, we come from training in economics and finance. So we weren't necessarily uh, working in organizational theory or we were not working necessarily in performance or teams. We're really looking more at, as, as the economy and, and the rule of, of money as our major proxies of reference. 
But the research we were doing has profoundly transformed our interests. So this is also where our interest for technology has culminated. And so has, as uh, uh, Professor Tom was equally uh, mentioning before, the fact that we started to work more around artificial intelligence really came as a side effect or a collateral of our interest in volatility. Now, all of this to take you a little bit closer to the conversation I'd like to share, we'll get to the core of it very soon. Now, we started to look at some interesting information. So why do we talk about uncertainty today? Well, first of all, because we could not really talk about uncertainty before. If you're looking at the evolution of GDP as a metrics of aggregate uh, exchange of supplies, um, supply demand, and mainly the exchange of goods and services in a given economy, we noticed that we were sort of like flat for most of history. But if you're looking at GDP in terms of the aggregation of activities in today world, you notice that in the specific graph, we're looking at something extremely different from before. Now, this was a snapshot of the total world GDP in 2008. Um, we was around 65 trillion. Today, we are about 70, 70, 75 trillion. Um, so even if we have increased, it doesn't necessarily change, increase marginally from 65 to 75. It doesn't change the fact that there is a disproportion between where we currently are and where we were before. Now, interesting on that, a lot of our economic models and our modeling techniques, they are inspired by uh, groundbreaking work that really was conducted primarily in the first part of the 20th century. So if we go from most of the economic theory that still rules today, uh, we really have evidence of the theory emerging from the period of time in nine, from 19 to 1950. Um, so the, the heritage of those theories, as much as we appreciate the historical uh, contribution, they tend to be minimal in terms of understanding the kind of problem we're facing today. As we are currently facing a global challenge, uh, we are actually confronted with the ability, with the risk, with actually the responsibility of addressing the challenge, but none of the previous model truly helps in trying to uh, navigate this through. And that's because we have profoundly changed the chemistry of uh, the world the way we know it. Now, this picture is not the only one that shows you that we have truly um, changed forever the way we are. So uncertainty which is the light motive of our conversation today, is something that has really been ingrained in the, in the ability for us to become a different society as we have expanded, not only in terms of, of population and GDP, but in every possible metric that is attached to our model of growth that we have somehow established um, on the offset of the end of World War II. Now, again, this is uh, another interesting conversation as you know, at Thunderbird, we have been embracing the idea of industrial revolution um, with everything we have. We currently pioneer in the fourth one. But the fact that we're talking about industrial revolution really is something that has an historical relevance. This is an interesting example where we really see that for many, many years, uh, only the country that were truly um, investing into this form of, of expansion of their economy were able to define some form of variation into the graph. Um, so we have had industrial model for most of our modern history with marginal and proportional, if otherwise said, linear development. But it's only in recent times as we have started to shift away from the tangible asset and moving on to the intangible ones that we have really seen the rise of an entirely different model. We talk about exponential these days. I'm sure that together with unprecedented you might have heard also terms beside the pandemic and beside draconian, which has to some extent become quite popular as well, um, and self-isolation. You equally has heard a lot the terms of exponential. Now, it has been misused. When we're looking at um, exponential in terms of population, um, we can talk about exponential because uh, we are a finite resource, but clearly when you're shifting into the digital world, you can create exponential value because simply numbers, they are accelerating a pace larger than any form of formal equation can justify. And this is to be demonstrated in very, in very easy ways in this teasers. How long did it take for us, for example, for the telephone to reach half of the American households? How long did it take for the radio to get to 50 million listeners? How long did it take Facebook to actually build a population of 600 million? Now, again, this was from McKinsey 2015. He has an interesting information highway of how we really have been 
accumulating the penetration rate of any given technology. Just to give you a point of reference, um, when we were able in six years to get about 600 million users on Facebook, just as a point of reference, Facebook and Instagram today, they count on a population of about 2.7 billion. So we're really talking about a degree of penetration that is different from everything that we have ever seen before. So why did I decide to talk about this as we're talking about leadership in uncertain times? Well, because we have to understand that uncertainty has become part of a norm that we have to some extent indirectly shaped as we change our business, our business models, as we change our procurement, as we change the way we do business, but equally as we change the way we are mainly living our life with the expectation we have on what we should have, the expectation on consumerism. So it's mainly a direct reflection of who we are that has to some extent unlocked this potential for exponential dimension to be part of our life. And when you're dealing with numbers that are not get easily distributed on an X or Y axis, you naturally are going to see phenomena that we have never seen before. So uncertainty is the new normal, mainly because we have embraced the kind of life since we decided to become a first, third, and then fourth industrial revolution society, which basically means that technology has shaped profoundly the way we define value by shifting the creation of value from the physical world to the digital one. So conversations such as exponential digital and combinatorial, that is something that we equally explore in the book. Um, it's something that mainly defines that uncertainty has become the way in which we run organizations today, in which we run societies today, to some extent the way we equally measure our life today. So it has been a transformation of the social narrative, a transformation of the economic narrative, and also transformation of the technological narrative. Because if before the Industrial Revolution were somehow supported by a technology that was enhancing efficiency, Today, this technology no longer just a vector for efficiency, but it has become a major transformation of the value creation mechanism. Therefore, we're dealing with situations that most of the time we have never seen before. Now, when you're increasing volatility, you're equally increasing the chances for things to become extreme. Now, one thing is to understand it from a perspective of the weather or the climate, I think we all are understanding that the climate is clearly transforming from what we sense an alleged sense of equilibrium to a, an entropic form of equilibrium, which is mainly a transformation that is happening around the systems. So the biodiversity is definitely showing to us that there is transformation, there is mainly evolution. But from an economic perspective, as much as we have accelerated, sometimes we have also decelerated by hitting into what we call crisis. Now, crises are congenial to the system. In other words, the system is designed for crisis to be part of it. So sometimes we see crisis as being an externality, something that we don't want to have, but to some extent they're constitutional to the way in which high volatility defines extreme acceleration between high performance and low performance. So to some extent, the concept of inflation and deflation um, is to some extent something we want to accept. Now, what kind of crisis do we talk about? Well, we usually talk about two kinds of crises. The one that you tend to talk about most of the time is the one referring to the financial crisis. And it's a crisis determined by the fact that the capital formation is struggling. That, for example, banks are not lending. Uh, that central bank have to actually um, issue more money or print more money or to some extent uh, issue bonds. So there's a whole conversation that is very um, entailed within the context of finance. A good example of this is what we have experienced in 2008 with the financial crisis. Now, we do have financial crisis historically for, for many, many years. Now, some of the crisis can be financial per se. The example of a bank, um, a bank that is failing, like Lehman Brothers. You can have a crisis that is determined by the price of oil. You can have a crisis which is determined by, for example, um, geopolitical events. So we have crises that become financial crises, even if the genesis and time is not financial per se, it might be in any of the asset of the economy that gets to some extent uh, heated or um, contracted. But there's another kind of crisis that tends to happen on the territory, which is what we call the real economic crisis, when for some reason the economy stops, uh, the 
perfect example of that is if you have a conflict or a war and life or business as usual cannot continue. So clearly shops will close and people will not go to work and school will actually shut down. And these are kind of crises that tend to be very severe because they truly pause, suspend the life of an economy, the life of a region, the life of a country. Now, interesting on that, we have never seen, with the exception, of course, of uh, World War I and World War II, which were global conflicts, the combination of a financial crisis and a real crisis occurring at the same time. So why is that we are currently living an unprecedented crisis? Well, that's because we are truly, for the first time, moving into a change that has never been experienced before. Briefly on a couple of slides before going deeper into that. When we're talking about the development we currently have, we mainly notice that the systemic and uh, the impact that we're having when we are looking at high speed events means that we are much more um, exposed to some form of group thinking. It means that if a group of society decides for something, we will most likely uh, follow that. So peer pressure is one of the drivers. We are also interdependent. We've been hearing this over and over again in the last few, uh, few uh, days or, or weeks. That's because suddenly the systems are connected. So if you have a shock in the system where you might have an expression of supply side, let's say, for example, a country like China, that because of uh, um, the, uh, the coronavirus has to stop production, clearly the impact will also happen in the demand side because the availability of product will actually be less available than before. So we might have scarcity. But the same can happen if the shock happens in New York, which is a demand side economy, and suddenly the liquidity is not there, whoever is on the, on the supply side of the story will start noticing that the number of orders coming through might be less because now suddenly that equilibrium has been disrupted. So all I'm trying to say with this is that we actually are going to see the increase of systemic risk and systemic failures more and more because the way we define value today is no longer determined by a national or enclosed system. It's much more determined by an integrated system that we built on purpose to decrease the cost of production, to expand the ability to scale to customer and consumer and regions of the world that we have never uh, scaled before, and to make sure that we could consume because there is, to some extent, a visual relationship between growth, consumption, growth of GDP, and the fact that the financial solvency of an economy will be measured also by the speed of growth that a country can have. But this also means that if I am likely scaling my production by expanding my product around the world, by generating a benefit in equal way, if I have a contraction or a shock anywhere in the system, the number of the implication will be in the red somehow with some delay, but I will actually have an implication because that degree of dependence is now being established formally. And if you go into more strategic question, it's because the supply chains of any given company today is heavily inferred by this mobility of goods and services that really happen at the global level. So what it means if I have to bring it to the next level? It means that the number of cases that will be happening outside of the distribution of events is more likely to happen. This is a term you might have seen also a lot. Um, we see black swans coverage quite often these days. To give you a disclaimer, um, the current pandemic that happened at the beginning of 2020 is not the black swan. It's actually a gray rhino. And I have intentionally changed the animal because gray rhino is mainly a terminology to determine to, to describe large scale events that we can see. The only instance where we can talk about black swan is when the coronavirus happened in Wuhan. It was the first time that it was somehow impacting a community that imposed the consequential shutdown of the region because there was no warning. But once we knew that this was happening in Wuhan, the moment that they arrived elsewhere, we knew about it. Therefore, it's no longer unknown. Therefore, I'd like you to make sure that we are correcting the idea of this black swans applied to the current pandemic because it's not the black swan anymore. It's either a white swan, if you want to follow the words of Taleb, who is the person who is a introduce the term into the literature, or as a gray rhino, as a, as a way of using always animals' metaphors uh, to describe what happened. 
So as you notice in this, as you are increasing somehow the number of events occurring outside of the distribution of the probability curve, then you start having more unknown events happen. Now, what is unknown about the crisis that we're experiencing now? As I mentioned before, the unknown factor is not just the fact that we have um, a pandemic or that we have a virus, because if you're looking at the um, list of risk that the World Economic Forum has produced since the last few years, also in the 2020 version, one of the risks that we see happening more and more is really a risk determined by epidemics. It wasn't called a pandemic at the time, but it shows you that we were already close to that understanding. In fact, the risk that we're actually feeling right now, or the first time that we see this form of outlier that is outside the distribution, is the concurrent existence of a financial and a real economy crisis. I'm going to show you this from a, white, a, white, a quite a recent article from HBR, um, which is produced by Boston Consulting Group. You notice that there are two kinds of shocks. As we mentioned before, a shock to the financial system, which is what we have been seeing for most of our modern history, no matter whether the trigger was the financial institution itself or it was an asset like oil or gas or real estate, and the real economy freeze, which is the example I mentioned before, that can happen when the economy for some reason has to stop, like, for example, during a conflict. Now, when you're locking down on a given economy, you are not wholly inducing a real economy freeze, but you're also indirectly creating a financial system shock. So what is somehow unprecedented of the current crisis that we have been experiencing at, from the beginning of 2020 is the fact that for um, this combination of the two form of shocks are actually happening at the same time. And we have no blueprint for this. We have no way to look back at the past and define what was actually the answer. Because all of the other examples that might have some form of historical relevance, they don't have the same distribution or diffusion of the current events. Uh, we don't have a blueprint on how to deal with the issue of such a size when they have been distributed on the global level. And this is something that, of course, is going to have an impact uh, that is quite profound, so to say. Um, so all of this, the interesting part about this is that this is leading to uh, a number of possibility and scenario that we need to actually deploy if you want to understand in which way we can lead in uncertain times. So first takeaway from this part of my conversation with you, I'm aware that uh, we're going to have some question and answer coming soon. So I want to bring it up to a point in which your question and answer can really go as close as you wish from your real interest. We have seen the rise of uncertainty as a direct consequence of the way we have simply decided to grow as our economies. We have seen the fact that volatility, scale, complexity, but equally uncertainty and ambiguity, they're part of a constitutional form of our life to now be uh, reflective of the business models. We, therefore, we should never be surprised that we live in a certain time because it's to some extent is a state of norm, is a state of normality or normalcy that we have created ourselves. As we have increased the acceleration of growth and therefore volatility, we equally have increased the occurrence of shocks or crises or some form of deflationary phenomena that have changed our perception of normal. And in the past, those two crises were to some extent either financial or real economy they never been somehow a combination of the two. We also seen that crises are by design global because of the dependency that we have created around the system on global distribution supply chain, but simply the way company makes their own um, value proposition around the world. So we are to some extent demystifying this as being a problem that happened now. What happened now is a combination of these two factors, but we are somehow constantly um, indirectly leading to the creation of this crisis is by the way we currently are, unless we profoundly change the way we generate value, we change our financial system, but this conversation we might have more punctually in the Q&A. Now, where do I take you from here? Well, I wanna take you more into some of the conversation that show you the kind of reflection that is required before we can really draft leadership responses in situations like this. This is again, a snapshot from a 2020 report from the World Economic Forum. Um, you can't see the reference because it actually is being curtailed, it's being cropped by the way in which the slide looks. But it's mainly from Global Risk Report 2020 from the World Economic Forum. 
Now this so like complex map, try to uh, define where most of the risk are coming from. I'm sure you see at the center of our attention, climate action failure. Uh, you see global governance failure. You see involuntary migration. You see social instabilities. This is where man water crisis, they were mainly crises that we can anticipate as being likely, or at least that they carry a degree of risk that is uh, worth considering. Infectious diseases, you know, this is on the uh, left hand side, on the top and left hand side, relatively smaller in size, which means that when they were doing the modeling, the likelihood for this to happen was less than things like, for example, climate action failure. Now, it shows you even this, that extremely sophisticated entity like the World Economic Forum, where their content generation and their knowledge generation is one of the uh, probably uh, top in the world in many, many circumstances, they are unmatched. Um, even their modeling was underplaying the possibility for something like infectious disease to happen. It shows you that all of these models that we see, they are great to provide us with a spectrum of reference, but they will never be able to provide us with the timeline of when these things can happen or with the degree of magnitude in which they will actually happen for real. One thing is to estimate the potential. The other thing is to actually unlock or unleash or trigger the real phenomenon. There's always some form of discrepancy. So how do we really predict? It's not the way we're going to game this. We can't game theory predictions anymore. There are too many variables and no matter how sophisticated our computers are, uh, we won't be able to really define the question that matters to us the most, when will it happen and how? We won't be able to do, to do this. We'll know that they matter, that there is a chance for this to happen in, and they tend to be inevitable, uh, but we won't be able to really answer those questions that tend to become interesting for the preemptive side of the story. So what can we do instead? Well, as you understand from the way I'm, I'm referring to this, you can only try to work on the responsiveness and how you anticipate in the response by understanding the possible actions required for a phenomenon to be mainly be embraced or tackled. So it shows you again that prediction are important, but we will never be able to be completely reassured by prediction because events in real world they tend to outsmart any form of prediction. This is not only now, it's been the case for quite some time. Now, what will be the impact in this specific period of time where we're looking at this combination between um, financial crisis and of course real economy freeze, which is happening now of course because of the COVID-19, but you could argue that it could happen also tomorrow if another uh, global crisis might simply manifest itself with similar condi con condition. We know this is that some specific entity will increase their benefit as always because resilience is also the ability for the system to adapt itself to transformation. You see specific acceleration happening uh, in rapid moderate or, or uh, rapid moderate impact. You also notice others that will be of course more impacted and we're gonna have of course more inflection points to take into account, but equally we'll see a lot of different areas where this will become critical. In other words, crises happen with the intention of simply decrease and acceleration that might have become untenable. What we currently experience is a combination or concurrence of crisis that tends to make it even harder uh, to really think about blueprinting this from past experiences because we don't have that experience before. At the same time, some businesses will prosper and simply navigate to the next level. Other businesses will be impacted in, in a significant way and other businesses will actually die. This is the nature of transformation that tend to be so profound. The foundation of the ground in, of the ground in which they're mainly uh, uh, erected will simply change. So we should think that leading a certain time is not simply trying to recover what we had before, because unlikely it will happen, is how do we redesign system as we have somehow taken awareness of where the system has been shifted by this micro, meso, or macro shock, depending whether we're looking at a shock at the social level, shock at the institutional level, or shock at the uh, more governmental level or geopolitical level. So it's important that we see this as, as a conversation. This is another interesting work that was published recently by um, the Boston Consulting Group that has, I think, in my opinion, a great uh, area for development. And then specifically to the work that, that I do, uh, we try with my co-authors uh, to uh, come up with something similar. 
uh, this is again, this is uh, coming from another conversation that we've been having about where will be the short economic impact. You see two different color. The red uh, despises mainly somehow where we see most of the, the mortality of possible businesses eventually suffering. The green is where we see eventually the growth models. Again, it's the same story of before, just this is much more rustic. It was done by us. Um, it's a way for us to really think more and more about the fact that in the years to come, um, we will see a real transformation of uh, the normalcy of what we have before, not because of a specific bad event that happened to us, but because crises happen, as I mentioned, part of the constitution in which we are uh, set up for. And when they happen, sometimes they simply disrupt, some other time they disrupt the foundation, and some other time they sweep away, they merely have reorganized and remobilized uh, where value will go over time. So this is why it's important for us to imagine that we will regain a form of normalcy, but it won't look like before, mainly because we have changed for good the process of uh, value creation. And no matter how much government intervention will try to keep systems alive, it will work in large conglomerates and large companies. It will not work with the micro ones because simply there's not enough uh, uh, solvency capital that can go in that direction. So what can we do as I'm trying to bring uh, this conversation to an end from my side and having time for question and answer? This is uh, something that I find interesting. Um, I'm not an organizational theorist, therefore I don't use a lot of this, um, but I start getting fascinated about this. This is the Kluber-Ross change curve. You know this, there is shock. I think we all understand where we, uh, the shock is mainly impacting us right now. There is denial. We don't want to believe this is actually happening. There is frustration. I think you are, like me, uh, perceiving frustration when suddenly events that we were not expecting change the way life uh, happens on a daily level. There is depression. There is uh, this feeling that we're getting drained by this. And then there is, of course, like uh, most griefing periods, there is experimentation, there is decision, and there is integration. I'm, the reason why I'm stopping with this slide is because I want you to understand that those organizations that will experiment now, they are the one that will be the architects of the normalcy that we're gonna have in the future once the specific crisis will be behind us. And that should, should be a lesson for us to learn all the time. The question is not how to avoid the shock. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. The question is how will we respond to any form of shock by experimenting and taking uh, somehow for granted the fact the normalcy is not recovering what we had before. Normalcy is building what we would like it to be, considering the condition that has somehow changed around us. And that's also a way for me to wish to all of you, no matter where you currently are in your life, professional or personal one, if you find yourself somewhere, somehow at the bottom of that, so like V shape or U shape, experimenting, taking action, decision, and integrating some form of acceptance is the only way we really have to move on by turning us mainly into entropic, somehow like natural systems. Because for too long we have been somehow spoiled and pampered in thinking that even life can be measured in an industrial format, but it cannot. So this is where I think we have about 20 minutes now for question and answer. And, and Tom, this is my last slide where I like uh, maybe the Q and A to, uh, to kick off. And um, I'm looking forward to the interaction we're gonna have with our attendees. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Mark. You've, uh, you've certainly prompted some wonderful thinking and, and I think grounded for all of us a bit of what we're experiencing here. Uh, and, and that's definitely evidenced by the, the questions that are coming in. So if you just a quick reminder, I know some of you are, are typing questions into the chat function. Will you please make sure that those questions are going into the Q&A function rather than the chat function? And then we'll get to as many of these questions as we can. Uh, we also make a commitment to you that if, if we can't get to your question, we'll do everything in our, in our power to provide some form of a, a curated response of the, the outstanding questions. So with that, Mark, let's take yes. uh, this first question here. We've got- Yes, I'm gonna you... stop the share, Tom, so uh, that I can also myself uh, uh, see the chat and the questions. Uh, and if go. need be, I can always go back to the share. All right. Um, yeah, where should I go? Should I go to the Q&A or go to the chat? I, I see two different. Yeah, let's, we're going to work from the Q&A. Okay, sure. And we're going to start with uh, this question. This, this takes us a little bit more into the geopolitical realm. 
Sure. But let's, let's look at, do you think current political trends can change the multilateral world into a closed, isolated world? And we might yeah. work with that word can and, and talk a little bit more about could. Is, is there a sure. likelihood? So thanks. And so Chris, uh, Chris, uh, thank you for your question. I, I think it's a wonderful question. It's one of those questions that I would ask uh, if I was on the other side, because I think that geopolitical is where we see uh, maybe some of the worries. We kind of accept uh, uh, for granted that there will be some form of organizational response from firms, but will the geopolitics change? What, what I'm worried about, so I'll start telling you what I'm worried about, is that <clears throat> the moment that we are somehow thinking in terms of nationalistic terms, uh, it's difficult to eventually simply switch it back to uh, inter interdependent or global terms, especially because even before the current crisis, we have been noticing a trend around the world to some form of inward looking. And my humble opinion, this was done um, without taking into account that the best nationalists are the one they are mainly able to play in the global arena. And, you know, uh, School Light Thunderbird, we know this. I think it's part of our DNA. <clears throat> We've always been part of this global understanding that the world is larger than our own environment. But there are many parts of the world where this is not uh, still um, so sensitive. So I, I would hope, this is a worry that I have, that we will uh, somehow have a period of time where we're looking more at the nationalistic or uh, really tight regional um, economies. On the other hand, which is the part that gives me optimism, Chris, we are already by far a much more globalized civilization than we ever been before. This is goes into the way we do business, the way we share information, the way we are, are sharing news, the way we are traveling, um, the way we are creating social bonds, the number of family that are now interracial or from different people. I mean, we have expanded to entirely different form of our social fabric. So it's not that easy to eventually shut that down. You know, there, there has been um, an enormous effort to become a convergent economy. I think these are a period of time where we are looking at more and more devolution, but I don't think we'll be able to reverse the, the process of globalization. Of course, what currently happened can hurt it a lot, but I'm an optimist in the sense. I think we are way past the recovery point of going back to nation states as we used to be before. But thank you for the wonderful question. Tom. You bet, thank you for that. Let's, uh, let's go a little bit more into another vein of yours that's, that's top of mind, which is artificial intelligence. And the question sure. is, uh, Professor Mark, do you think that the current health situation will change the policies of the use of artificial intelligence in population monitoring? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, Mamadou, thank you for this question. So the honest answer I have is that, of course, experimenting, as I was sharing bef before, has happened from the government perspective at the much faster pace than what we have ever experienced. All government have to find themselves, first of all, experimenting with policy they have never done before. They're experimenting uh, cures and vaccine and treatment against the virus. And we, they're also experimenting a situational control on the territory and that they had never done before. So I, I think the big winner of this is the fact the government has become again a big player in the picture. Um, of course, this can bring us to think that technology is a way to control population. Now it's justified under the assumption of public safety or public health. Of course, it can be justified and, and in, under the assumption of anything else. So the part, Mamadou, uh, scares me a lot. I think what we have learned specifically from both what happened in uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and China is that technology can be used to track citizens. Um, so we now know that from a capacity perspective, government can do that. Whether that will become normative or it will become the way every government will go, I don't know. But clearly, the fact that we have already breached the viability barrier, it's, of course, an area of vigilance that we should actually keep. So I'm keeping it there. I, I, I hope it is not necessarily the type of uh, government we'll have inherited for out of this, but Clearly, we know that we can do that. It's possible. It's no longer a matter of MVP. It's actually possible for a country to use technology to exercise control over their citizen. Tom. Thanks so much. You know, this next one, Mark, really comes into part of that tension between prediction and response. And I think there's, there's part of us that really wants to be able to predict. And then certainly there's another part of us that very much wants to be able to, to, to respond with with great agility yeah so let's let's jump into uh, over the years mm -hmm. 
in world history, there has been a conscious effort for possible prediction on the world economy, but no such research has been done on a possible outbreak of diseases in the health sector worldwide. Mm -hmm. I think that this is somebody who was listening to you quite nicely. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a gap that must be addressed. Is it possible for a team that should be formed globally to study the trends of unsuspected threats that affect the world? Mm, wow, that's also a, a quite, uh, so Wilson, thank you for this. I mean, you're asking a, a complex question, so I, I will only try um, because I think it's, uh, it's a question that requires more elaboration, but I'll try to give you uh, some insights. Um, I think there are ways for us to create responsive or responsiveness or response, responsive mechanisms to enable, in this case, government, but it can also be a private sector, a combination of the two, to really tackle with situation that we have never encountered before. And therefore, I think we can think about mutualizing resources better, using territory in a different way, collaborating with countries that don't have the same degree of pressure on their facilities. So we can come up with a model that can actually be deployed um, in case of emergency or, or urgency or crisis that I think we haven't done currently because I think under the current problem that we have with the pandemic, we have uh, seen the rise of a global problem, but we try to address it with national answers. And that for me is a methodology problem it's that you cannot, you cannot answer a complex problem with a simple answer. And that's, that's simply where I think we have been doing. I think it's important that countries start developing, but also intergovernmental capacity, like we have done for things like terrorism, crime, but also for space, uh, interest in having response mechanism in case unexpected events are actually happening. Because yes, we have to trust the scientific community. We have to trust the expert. We have to be able to be fast. But I think the key is to have a strategy and you know, many governments do not necessarily marry well with the concept of strategy. So how do we turn government more strategic? I think it's somehow the underlying question you're asking, Wilson. And I think we can do that. It's just a matter of reorganizing it in a different way. But, and I'm hoping that this is really the major um, winner of all of this current pandemic we're having. We'll be able to inherit a different sense of governance on crisis of the one that we had so far. Thanks for your question, Tom. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. Let's uh, bring in some representation from the range of questions and comments that we're seeing. So sure. this one's going to hone in on a particular industry. And the question is, what will be the likely impact of COVID on the renewable energy sector, as, as you understand it? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Sartak, thanks so much for this. So I guess is a question is also determined by the fact that we've been reading more and more about whether um, we have, uh, uh, we will actually accelerate the responses towards the climate, uh, climate change uh, intervention. But I think it's also determined sorry, by the fact that the price of oil because of this crisis has gone into the lowest historical ever recorded. You know, there's something to remember. When the price of oil went at $33 a barrel back in 2016, um, the number of countries that were actually making money out of oil were only five in the world, and all of them were concentrated in the Gulf, uh, with Saudi Arabia number one and Iran number two. Uh, with the price of oil going at the historical low as we have right now, I can maybe think that that number will no longer be five, maybe four or, or three. You know, there's a complication with the fact that when you are investing into CapEx, and lots of oil and gas is somehow CapEx intensive, um, it's not easy to simply move away from it. But I think that when you start having, you know, some form of pain points in the profitability, then the natural response is how do I diversify my portfolio so that I can decrease the pain point over time. So I'm hoping, Sartak, that, and, and I'm hoping that, you know, your comment is to some extent not only insightful, but also foresightful, and that we're really going to see more and more company investing into renewable because they will have understood that as oil and gas are commodity that trade into the market, therefore they can suffer the fluctuation of the trading mechanism. Uh, renewable is a much safer way to really hedge the risk. And I'm hoping this is gonna be the case. Thanks for your question, sorry, Doug. Tom. Mark, we're seeing a number of questions come in that certainly deal with the, the macro and the mastero as, as uh, you have so eloquently described for us. We're also seeing a number of questions about more of that micro level, that agent or even that interpersonal level. And, and so let's take a couple in that realm. 
Uh, one of them from Andre is, uh, thank you for the talk, Mark. How can leaders ease up people's lives during and after this crisis? Wow. Getting That's a, very yeah. much to the human element. Yeah, that's a beautiful question, uh, Andrea. Thanks so much for this. You know, I think one of the things that people are mostly afraid of is whether the crisis will also become a crisis of uh, economic deprivation. And I think this is something that we should avoid at every single cost. This is why, again, I might sound political, but public debt is designed especially for this. Government taking into account situations that are to some extent difficult to be supported by private entities, but government has the ability to absorb this. Um, so I, I would hope that, you know, a way for people to feel somehow reassured, Andrea, is to make sure that we're protecting employability. Um, I think one of the things people are mostly afraid is, is that the, the, the current crisis will lead to a financial crisis, and a personal financial crisis. And people should not be worrying about things like whether they can have access to healthcare or whether, and therefore be terrified to, to become sick or whether they'll be able to pay the tuition fee for their kids. You know, these are things that truly destroy people's life. So I think what companies should do right now is to uh, preserve as much as they can um, employability and they should really, and this is one side of the story, and government should actually have prioritized employability as a must, especially during this time. Not only for the benefit of the employees, because you can say, why should companies and bank take so much hit? Well, you know, company and banks has a way to eventually to write off some of the debt. If you have in some form of reassurance like bonds um, that can be issued by the government. But I think the reason why we want to preserve employability is that if we're really uh, willing to recover from a crisis, if we don't have access to the spending ability or for the fact that people will actually try to go back to normal life, the recovery will actually always be very hiccup and very bumpy. So it's in our best interest from an economic perspective to preserve employability, because not only that creates the social, the, the psychological compact is preserved, um, but it also preserves the social and the economic one. So I think that probably would be my take. Uh, and thanks for the question, address. Tom. Mark, this question does a, a really beautiful job of capturing a lot of the sentiment that we're seeing in the Q&A, but also some of the curiosities. And sure. Andreas from uh, across the Atlantic asks, uh, we're working in a new normal or we're working on new normal scenarios to come back to. Should we even plan to come back to normal or plan for a fresh start or, or both? Right. And so, Andreas, happy to see you here. Um, and I had the honor to meet Andreas in an event uh, in Lausanne. So, Andreas, I think that the new normal is really what we should put all of our efforts because it's really worked for us to become architects of that specific new normal. Um, first of all, because it's not the choice we have, Andreas. I don't think we can choose to go back to what we have before. There are too many ripple effects that are happening that are somehow changing the way we used to be before. And, and I think this is something that we have to accept as part of the grief that I think now we feel as grief, but eventually grief can only be accepted once you know that there is a new beginning ahead of you regardless of how painful it is. I think the opportunity will be in how do we get companies to really redesign or design from scratch that new normal by preserving those values that maybe were underplayed in the previous normal. You know, every crisis, of course, is an opportunity for renewal. Um, of course, the, the cost repaying is, is quite dire. And this is why I was referring before to the, and my answer to Andres, that we should try to preserve employability. And that would be something conservative to do now. But I think the question is really, how do we learn from the experience that have somehow co created this cohesion, cohesion about being a global community more than ever? Um, the fact that we have rediscovered the, somehow some of the implicit that we were having before. Um, we, had, we were taking for granted so many different things. I was taking for granted on a personal level how quickly it was to travel around the world. And now suddenly I realized that it depends country by country. And maybe we can start redefining the rules so that events in the future might not have necessarily the same impact that we had in this one. So I think the new normal is where I would put all of the efforts because otherwise we're creating this illusion of control about the past being relived or revived. And I don't think we'll be able to. Thanks for this, Andres. Tom. Okay, we've got question or time for maybe two or three more questions. Sure. You know, this one has a, a, a bit of a presumption embedded into it, but, but it, it certainly reflects a lot of what people are thinking here. And the question is, 
the reallocation of jobs due to this crisis uh, will give, or, or we could change that to could give multinationals even more power. To what extent do you see that happening or to what degree do you see that taking place? Mm -hmm. So David, thank you for this question. Uh, you know, I, I, I personally think that uh, you are onto something with your question, um, but it's not the specific pandemic that has really shifted the power towards more and more multinational. I think we have already seen a trend um, in the last few years that conglomerates were coming back. Um, you know, as, as Tom was telling you at the very beginning, I, I have a particular interest in artificial intelligence uh, my latest work is is uh, on a book on AI, and um, I've been noticing that the entire capacity for AI is in the hands of maybe eight or nine companies around the world. So in many in many ways, we have seen already already the the, the inevitable sliding of uh, global GDP in the hands of few multinationals. So yes, I think this simply will will increase or expand even more that trend. Um, like at the same time, the expansion of the power of the government. So I think we're going to go back to uh, sort of like a multinational versus government, sort of like they talk to me, um, that will have as a side effect uh, eliminate a lot of micro players. Uh, I'm thinking about all the startup, the innovators that might probably just simply suffer from the ac no access to capital right now. But this is where I'm hoping that going back to the question Andres asked before, the new normal will really be about reviving this ability for us to think differently about value and bringing again these players into the market. But I think your question is something that I can't deny. I think we're going to see more and more power concentrated in the hands of either private or governmental conglomerates. Tom? You know, this next question, Mark, is, uh, is wonderfully representative of we've, we've got this great audience spanning the globe and spanning demographics. And, and um, so let's bring something that, that might speak to a number of them. And the question comes from Pierre, who's mm -hmm. asking, we're witnessing outstanding uh, economic impact. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you think that the global economy will bounce back? And do you think, obviously, Pierre is coming from the, the framework or the, the standpoint of a student. Yes. Uh, but we could probably answer this for a number of, of constituencies, but how do you think that it will, the global economy will come back and do you still encourage students to display a great deal of interest in global statistics? Mm -hmm. Wow. So Pierre, uh, Pierre, Reed, thanks so much for this question. I mean, it's, it's elaborated in a way that uh, truly makes me, make, in, in, uh, and it's time for me to process this. Briefly on what I, are my feeling on this. Um, so again, we will bounce back in some capacity and we will not bounce back in other capacity. I think we, I don't believe in a scenario where we're going to have like a ground zero. I think we will, of course, bounce back. There are many businesses that will are simply going to be suspended. In many parts of the world, the government is already protecting a large part of the income that is lost. So, you know, we're not necessarily going into ground zero. Uh, so I think that part should be rebalancing a bit of the sense of urgency we have about what will happen when we resume. I still think it's important to look at the macro, uh, global statistics they define aggregates, because I think they give us a picture. I always describe this when I'm in a classroom, uh, Pierre. I say, you know, you can look at the environment from the airplane and you can get to see things like the topography, the size of the land, maybe the natural environment, the border with uh, rivers and, uh, and mountains, lakes. You get to see an understanding that it's really somehow very powerful. And, and I think global statistics, but in general aggregates, they do that. Um, whether that is enough, I think it's no longer enough. We have to understand that most of the action happened on the ground and the ability to reconcile, and, and Tom does this better than me, this understanding about macro, mis, meso, and micro, right? This combination of the three lenses of analysis concurrently being applied, I think it's an important part of the conversation that we have to some extent uh, miss to that extent, you know, I told you at the very beginning, my training is in economics and there is no a formal st uh, study of mass economics, not like you have macro and micro. We've been missing so much on this. So I think that the question is preserving global statistics, absolutely, but knowing that they are insufficient to answer some of the most critical questions, we need to bridge them down to meso and to micro as well. And I'm very thankful for your question, Pierre. Tom. Let's close with this final question here. And this comes from Maggie. And I, again, I think this is something on a lot of people's minds. 
She writes, uh, what do you think of the global leadership response to this current crisis? And do you think leaders could have done anything differently? And I might add, obviously hindsight is 2020, correct? Yes, yes. I, I, I... So Maggie, um, I, I personally think that if this crisis had proven something to us is the global issue was not ready for this. No matter what you're looking at the US or elsewhere, I think we all feel partially dissatisfied by the way government has responded. If it's not for the current response as the government started to respond, it might have been on the timing that have been taken. Um, the fact that we might have within the same continent, say for example, Europe, a country that went into lockdown and a country that is an hour flight, like for example, the UK, embracing herd immunity, regardless of what is the right approach, it shows you that we really have been lacking of orchestration um, like we have nothing in common, but of course we have a lot in common. I think that part is something that I'm disappointed um, and it shows that our global leader were never really global in the first place. They were mainly leader elected in national government, but they kind of like a miss on the opportunity that they had. Only a few days back, Maggie, the first example on a global level that six patients from Italy were transferred to Germany it shows you that it took us so long before discovering collaboration when we actually could have done it much earlier. So I am naturally disappointed about this, um, but I'm also hoping that this is a, a lesson for everyone, also the leaders, that you can operate your leadership unless you're trying to play um, a team or team member. And the team member needs to be somehow reflecting on the fact that challenges that we have these days some of them are national and they need to be addressed with national responses, but many of them are, are actually global and they cannot be politicized. They have to be part of an effort that we have to actually uh, navigate to create an intergovernmental response when challenges are of such a magnitude. I'm hoping I answer your question, Megan. Thanks for it. Tom. Thank you so much, Mark. We're going to have to close there. We, we do have a number of additional questions. We would love to get at least some written responses out to the, to the group here and look forward to doing that for the, for the whole. Mark, you've, you've been incredibly enlightening and very gracious with your time. So appreciate you coming and joining with us today. And, and I do want to give a, a special thanks to all those at Thunderbird who, who helped to make these things possible. And thank you to you all for attending and, and for really engaging this as a, a truly global dialogue. By way of, of really quick close, I did mention at the beginning that this is brought to you by Thunderbird uh, Executive Education. There's a, a whole host of digital offerings within Exec Ed, including topics that would help you to go deeper on this theme or similar themes. I might draw your attention especially to uh, the Certificate on Global Leadership that has items on transformational leadership in the 4IR, but also on this future ready concept of disruptive innovation that, that Mark has really nicely bridged for us here today is, is even a, a bit of a teaser. Uh, you can find that at thunderbird.asu.edu forward slash exec ed. We'd also like to invite all of you to continue to be part of these ongoing global dialogues. We're gonna have these installments at least weekly going forward really for the foreseeable future. So please check your inboxes for future events. And again, thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful remainder of your week. And thank you again to you, uh, my friend and colleague, Mark. Thanks to you, Tom, for moderating. This was uh, a great, I was actually happy that you started and you helped me moderate because I he also gave us a chance to, uh, to talk in the meantime and to realign our thinking. And um, to all of you, uh, thank you for having spent time with us today. Um, we truly are uh, reflecting somehow this, this engagement towards the fourth industrial revolution. And one of the side effects of the revolution is also the fact of dealing with global challenges. So I'm happy you guys trusted uh, this space for the many questions you had and uh, all the best. And thanks for the team that work uh, tireless to make this happen. I mean, they, you see them connected as part of the panelists, but they have worked a lot in making this uh, success. So thanks to, uh, to them because they, uh, they are phenomenal. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye Let's bye. engage very soon here. Bye.